you mind if I live here? So, this room is completely inappropriate. Um, I'll see what I can do. I am also assuming that uh, the lecture tonight will be difficult, and I suspect maybe half of you will disappear, because the idea of Hegel is attractive, but the reality is somewhat different. Uh, the phenomenology is textual. Simply textually is, you know, sentence for sentence. The hardest philosophical book I know of. And, and if you really, I mean, you really all want to do this, uh, uh, it is really stressful. But at any rate, we, we, will, we will see how it goes. We will find another room. We will uh, do all those things. Uh, the first thing I want to do, so uh, I want to be sure that all the people who are registered for this course have a syllabus. Do you all have a syllabus? And do all the people who are registered for the course also have this single sheet about the mini commentary schedule? No? Uh, is that still going around? There are some there. You want to, you want to pass them forward? Um, if not, let's see, you know, let's see oh, we'll do some more at half time. This is Rocio Zambrana. She will be the TA for this. As you can see, I'll need some help. And I will obviously put in a request for a different group. Okay, let me just uh, find out of uh, the registered people uh, who is here. And then we'll, I'll say something about the mechanics of the course. Christine, Christina Acosta. Hi. Juliana Agoli. Hi. Elizabeth Atkins. Avita Bansi. Sequestered there. Um... Cameron Basiri, Sarah Baxley, Sarah Nicole. Sarah Nicole. They just may gave you an N, <laughs> but you're Sarah Nicole. Okay, that is absolutely fine. That's the other thing you know. Since I'm just calling out names, you can change your name. You can call it anything you want. This is a great opportunity for that. Scott Belcher. Thomas Bretz, <laughs> Jacob Browning, Matthew Congdon, David Craig, Cameron Crane, come on in, Jason Fizet, Jason. Richard Flynn, uh, Ashley Garvey, Adam, please, Shen Goel, Edward Gomo, Christopher Haddix. Allie Handelman, Maria Heckman, Christopher Hightower, Rika Josephson, Kathleen Kelly, Todd Kesselman, Thomas Krell, Catherine Legg, Brendan Mullally, Robin Muller, hey. Ben Olson, Thank you. 
Uh, Stephen Orr, Christopher Penfield, Matthias Peters, Joshua Panetta, Alexei Proshin, Robert Ramos, Daniel Restrepo, Karen Sivan, Barry Simon is here, Scott Shushin is here, Tomas Stolen, Anna Strellis, Keith Whitmoyer, there you are, and Angus Woods. Anyone else who's registered for this course whose name I have not called out? Uh, can you just show your hands if you are just audited? Yes. Okay. Uh, I warn you, we will do this. If I cannot find a room, I will have to exclude auditors for obvious reasons. So we'll give this a week and see how it shakes out. But uh, the 45 people who have registered for this course, you know, uh, get first did. So, and this is not workable as it is for the whole year. Um, so we will see how it goes. But uh, first, first, obviously, I have first responsibility. The students are really registered for this course. Uh, so we will do it that way. Okay. Um, uh, I want to do some business things. Again, this is with respect to those who are in this course. Um, the first thing you want to look at is the very, very long syllabus. Um, Is there any syllabi floating around? get more than a half time as well. Okay. So there are two required texts for the course, Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit in the Miller Translation and um, Hegel's on Christianity, Early Theological Writings. We will be starting with that text next week. Both of those should be in Barnes & Noble on 18th Street and, of course, easily available from Amazon. As I just said, um, Hegel's text is just the surface texture of it, the writing of it, is brutally difficult. Uh, you will not even want to attempt to read it without uh, at least one, and I always suggest probably more than one commentary. Um, and I've said something about all the various commentaries uh, here, so I've, I've given you, and they are all also on reserve in the library. Not the text, just the commentaries. Like photocopies of section two. No. Nope. 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 Got to, got to get the books. This is uh, we're going to have these books, and you'll be teaching them for the rest of your life. So <laughs> this is uh, got to get. Yeah, that is no, no, it doesn't work that way. Um, if you are feeling really unsure about it uh, and really want a leg up to begin with, then I recommend Robert Stern's Hegel and the Phenomenology of Spirit. That is the best introductory commentary. It is clear. It is perspicuous. The best thing to use it for is actually to read it before you read the text. Uh, so you do not get lost in the text. Uh, and it is helpful and, and fine and, and good and, you know, all those kind of virtues. Um, the, uh, once you are thinking hard about any topic, as you'll see, I give you masses of things to look at for each topic, but the two, wildly, the two best commentaries are the classic one by Hippolyte, which is still uh, uh, staggeringly great, 
And now H.S. Harris's Two Volume Hegel's Ladder, uh, which uh, will is a is a really paragraph by paragraph reading of the book, and gives gives both for each paragraph of the book he gives both a kind of short restatement, and then gives you all the historical references it, it could contain. I mean, it's a kind of well, but it's also a reading, a very clever reading, um, and it is part of what you will see to be the contemporary, we'll, we'll simply call deflationary readings of Hegel. That is, this is these are all, and you will be exposed to a, uh, an anti-metaphysical reading of Hegel. Hegel has no such thing called the absolute. There is no such thing as, you know, uh, the one that expresses itself. Everything, for example, that Charles Taylor says about Hegel is false. Uh, that's a good... If you want to read Charles Taylor's sentence, but Chuck, Chuck is a friend of mine, so be quiet about that, but sentence by sentence, almost every sentence is false. Um, so if you just put a negation, you'll probably... Read. And that's actually the way Hegel thought, too, right? That's the way he actually... say show him. Um, but uh, so I'd say something about all the rest of these commentaries. They all have um, different strengths. For those of you who are coming out of this, having really worked your little butts off on Kant, uh, the the book that's changed Hegel discussion in the Anglo-American um, philosophical world is Pippin's Hegel's Idealism. Uh, that's, that's the book that does uh, the Hegel as the completion of Kant and a version of that um, uh, he's a bit too epistemological for me um, but a version of that is the version we'll be uh, doing in this course okay so you need to acquire for yourselves um, the text and a commentary or two uh, the second thing, now turning to the mini commentaries by organization, is because this text is so hard, what you want to be doing, and what you in fact must do, for those relations of the course, is write commentaries, short, 700, you know, 500, 750 word praises in your own words of uh, the various sections. And I recommend that you do this for each of the topics we cover. Uh, uh, if I were you, I'd write one a week, but uh, the rule is you must write at least four. Um, and what I'm going to ask is for all the people who are registered in the course, I did this last year with the Kant, and it kind of worked rather well, so I want to try this again. Um, at, we're going to have a break after about an hour. One thing we all need air. Um, and at that point, I want you to uh, gather up with three or four friends to form a study group. Uh, everyone is going to be in a study group. Uh, and the idea behind the study groups, uh, first of all, you should know that in 1788, um, Hegel shared a room with Schelling and Hurdle. They were roommates. They didn't just know one another. Right? They, they were roommates at a college. Right? The student was stiff. Now, uh, you need to be working through this text with philosophical friends. Um, so you need to have a study group and the study group, you can write your commentaries and then you exchange them amongst yourselves. And in that way, you can kind of check whether you are keeping up or your friends can tell you you're not, or, but kind of people you are working through the text with, you can either meet in person or online. But one thing you want to do, so at halftime, if you all could um, form yourselves in study groups and then just give me a slip of paper with your names of four or five people who are going to be in your study group. And then, the next order of business, is during the first uh, five weeks of the semester, 
I will give you next week, I will give each of the study groups a number. And each week I'll have, as you see, some of you submitting your mini-commentaries to me. The weeks that uh, um, you're not submitting to me, you can be submitting to Rossio, and you must submit the three other required commentaries to her. The requirement is you must write four commentaries. You will not get a grade on your essay until you have written four commentaries. And the point is, of course, not to do this at the end. The whole point is this is to be, it, it's just, you know, getting you writing, thinking clearly about the text. And these will actually form little bits of what you're going to write your essays on. Right? Yeah. Okay, and then at the end of the semester, you can uh, write an essay, and I will grade that. Okay, any questions about class mechanics? Okay. Good. So the deal is, we will. Uh, I'll, I'm going to chat for about an hour. We'll have a break, and then I will chat for another hour or so. So this will sh- this will drift on. The nice thing about the eight o'clock slot is it can go on till well, not 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 one or two in the morning, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> scared you, didn't I? Yeah. Now they throw us out. Uh, uh, but we'll we'll drift on to ten fifteen, ten twenty, ten thirty, something like that. The guy gets kind of ratty after 10.30 and and it gets crossed. Okay, what I want to do today is is offer an introduction, um, mainly epistemological, mainly about the relationship between Kant and Hegel, mainly about the thought that Hegel completes Kant, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and this is the bit that may scare you all the way and you think, oh, well, I'd rather be doing something much more interesting. Um, and then next week we'll read, uh, I, I, I find the spirit of Christianity and its faith, that text, the best early Hegel that introduces the later system. Uh, so that, that text, and I'll tell you what bits of it to read, uh, will form another kind of introduction and give us a leg up from the early Hegel, which is reads beautifully, it's just a gorgeous text, uh, and tell us where we're going. Well, for me, the phenomenology is simply the most riveting text of philosophy ever written. It is unspeakably thrilling. And part of its thrillingness is that it is simply unlike any other philosophical text that came before it or indeed came after it. It has no followers, even by Hegel. And I'll say something about how I think the phenomenology is something that even slips out of Hegel's control, and that he is not in complete control of the argument which is richer and exceeds, I believe, his own system. Well, what makes the phenomenology so gripping? Well, what Hegel does, as I guess great philosophers always do, is not answer old problems, or not directly, but they change the topic. They change the, uh, the, what we're talking about. And Hegel made, I guess, <coughs> two moves that really changed the topic of what philosophy is even about, or could be about. And then there's a third move involved, which is significant for understanding how he achieved the other two. Well, let's begin with the obvious. Modern philosophy begins with the thought of self-consciousness, with the discovery of subjectivity, with the I think, therefore I am, that idea, that self-consciousness, right, is uh, certain of itself, is the ground or foundation of possible 
uh, other knowledge, that this idea of, of self-consciousness, of the discovery of subjectivity, subjectivity, I mean, subjectivity is, as I understand it, self-consciousness. That is, the relation of the self to itself as a condition for a possibility of relationship to the world is constitutive of what we mean by subjectivity. So to be a subject is to be in this self-conscious relation. Kant deepens the Cartesian thought with his notion of the transcendental unity of apperception, that is, with the thought that the I think must accompany all my representations, or otherwise something would be represented in me which could not be thought at all. The old B131132 jiggle. Hegel changes the subject. He contends that the minimal unit for there to be self-conscious agency is two. That you cannot be a self-conscious agent by yourself. You are not in an immediate self-relation to yourself. On the contrary, your relationship to yourself, you being yourself, is mediated by the other. So you are, in ways that we will discover, absolutely dependent on the other, absolutely dependent on what is not you. Now, one might suppose that that is enough of a break, but actually Hegel goes even further for he doesn't think that two is enough. Maybe the minimal unit is two, but as every lover has always discovered, two is never enough. We always need a third. Run that thought any way you wish. <laughs> so Hegel's definition of self-consciousness is the I that is a we and the we that is an I. That is, his claim is going to be that instead of an I think, we are going to require a we think. And it's the notion of the we think that is implied or involved in his notion of Geist. The phenomenology of spirit is a phenomenology of Geist. Geist, or spirit, is the we that is an I, and the I that is a we. So the idea that we are always involved in a community of some sort, uh, Hegel calls language the Dasein of spirit. Well, if I could figure out what that meant, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. I'd be writing a great book. Uh, language is the being there of spirit. It's the way in which, it's the medium through which a community, as it were, passes itself on, recognizes itself, <laughs> talks to itself, so embeds itself. Now, this is extraordinarily thought uh, what that came to me uh, independently of Hegel one day in uh, that bar just opposite Columbia was it the West End bar is that the old place where everyone goes to get yeah that's it okay so I was uh, skipping my Greek class and a friend and I were arguing about Freud and I said my problem with Freud is he suffers, and I read too much Whitehead in my youth, he suffers the problem of misplaced concreteness. 
He thinks the mind is in your head. And my friend, so where do you think mind is if not in your head? And I said, here, between us. So Hegel has this notion of mindedness or geist that somehow the mind is not in the head, not where the head is or not to be located there, but somehow bound up in the practices and relations one has with one's others who they might be. And I'm going to say who they are in a minute because now here's Hegel's second move. You might think, well, that's enough already (laughs) to to get rid of the premise of modern philosophy, namely metaphysical and methodological individualism. That's, That's the move here, that he destroys the idea that the fundamental unit from which we begin philosophy and through which we do philosophy is the standalone individual, the mind knowing itself, and says that the minimal unit is going to be some broader object. But then in the middle of his book, having already made that move, he says, well, well, about this we think. Well, what is it we think? (laughs) This we think instead of the I think. And what we think is not really flatly up to us. We can't think anything we want. Uh, In fact, we often get the feeling we can't think anything we want. Rather, there is, and here's the next new topic of conversation, history. That our community, our linguistic community, is conditioned by the language we have and the resources we have and the relations we have to one another are all conditioned by history. And to say they're conditioned by history is to say a bunch of things, uh, figuring out what it means. But anyway, spirit is, Hegel says, it's history. And one of the things that means is this. That we are, right here and now, a community of the living and the dead that the dead are always with us and that we have to find adequate means of acknowledging in our collective and communicable practices our relationship to the dead. This is what the famous chapter on Antigone and then the even more famous chapter on absolute knowledge are all about. How to live with the dead. So when Hegel says... Philosophy is its own historical epoch conceptualized in thought. He means unearthing the history that allows us to be here speaking in the way in which we do. That we are not only dependent on one another and on all this linguistic community, but we are dependent on the concrete history that got us here. Well, what bits of the concrete history? Well, Hegel's going to give us a story about that concrete history, a story that includes the Greek world, the Roman world, the absolute state, discussions of Aeschylus, Sophocles, Antigone, Diderot's Ramu's nephew, the French Revolution, the nature of the guillotine, and so forth and so on. That is suddenly now, philosophy is connected to non-philosophy. To what philosophy has no control over, to what you cannot know a priori or by reflection or anything like, But really, philosophy itself finds itself conditioned by things that are bits of concrete history, certain kind of history, but certainly concrete history. 
Now, in this, Hegel has almost no successors. I cannot think of any philosopher who included in the core of their thought the role of history as a condition for self-consciousness in the way that Hegel does. Heidegger, of course, pretends to, but it's, 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 you know, and and of course, the whole question is, you know, what's the difference, right? And then the other side is, Marx will argue against Hegel, not historical enough, right? Right? So, So this is a fraught area. But the fraughtness is where the thrill is, because if Hegel is right, if he can convince us that you can't talk without the mediation of the other. You can't talk about the mediation of the other without talking about the we think. And you can't talk about the we think without talking about history. Then those debates, let's call it the finessing of history, right, and Heidegger's story and the attempt to to, uh, reduce philosophy to history, the Marx version, um, Although, it be another course, I think actually Marx is more philosophical than Hegel. Right? That's the fault of Marx. He's too philosophical, not historical enough. But however you do it, right? and of course the, the one person who's going to contest Hegel over this history is going to agree with him and disagree with him at every moment as he believes destiny. The name I was repressing. Okay. okay. But Foucault got the point, right? He said what he believed. He knew what the stakes were, and what he he too wanted to write a history of the present. Uh, but he had a different idea of what it meant to write a history of the present. But that's the stake. That's the stakes, and the right is not concerned. The right stakes. My claim is that once you have gone through this Hegelian move, there's no going back. So if you don't want to make the move, this is a good time to leave. <laughs> Whoa, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to have to have to read history too. Forget it. Then there's a third move, which is not novel, but which is fundamental, uh, which is novel in the context of... of um, and is fundamental to the Hegelian program. Everyone was trying to figure out how to get beyond Kant. What do we do about Kant? And I'll explain why Kant's such a problem. What do we do about Kant? And, of course, like all good nerds, in order to answer that question, they just kept reading more Kant. Um, and finally, he helped them out by publishing the Critique of Judgment. And the Critique of Judgment contains a thought that had not really been uttered philosophically since the time of Aristotle. And that's the thought of organism. Hegel, early on, was impressed with Aristotle. And what he saw in Aristotle, and what he and Schelling uh, and Herdelin and all their friends, including the young romantic, I mean, everyone got out of the third critique, is a way of avoiding both atomism and formalism. Now, atomism and formalism go together. They go together uh, in the following way. Atomism is the belief that there are irreducible particulars. Formalism is the belief that there are a priori universals. So the problem for the tradition, the problem that we know goes right back to Plato, is the relationship between universal and particular. And the thought is, well, if you've got these universals, if they're going to have any weight whatsoever, 
right? Then they are going to swallow up the particulars and therefore swallow up finitude, history, all the concrete stuff. But the other way is if you start with just particulars and say, ah, let's go with them, then you get nominalism, relativism, and skepticism, i.e. the debate between rationalism and empiricism, of which for the people following him, they read Kant as just another rationalist. As I'll say in a second, he's a, a kind of formalist. Now, the way in which they are going to answer this is not to think of a new or better relationship between universal and particular, although God only knows there's plenty about universal and particular all over Hegel. Rather, they are going to say that the primary relationship is not universal and particular, but part to whole. And they are going to allow a dynamic view of a part-whole relationship. I've already said that I'm absolutely dependent on you. Well, that means um, a part of a whole. And I've already said that two is not enough. Therefore, we are all parts of a wider communal linguistic community. And I've already said that that community is not self-sufficient. It's part of a history. So you see the logic of part and whole is really a different way of trying to think about the fundamental ways of of starting this thinking off. And that is going to run throughout it. And what the issue will be, what's the mechanism for the movement of these relationships? How is it that individuals do not become mere parts of wholes and get swallowed up with them the way they used to get subsumed under universals? Nonetheless, the movement from part to whole is certainly a structural movement in Hegel's forms. Okay, so those are the, the three moves, I think, that get Hegelian thought going. Well, let's put this in context. Namely, the movement from Kant to Hegel. We all know, or if you don't, I'm telling you right here and now, that Hegel is known as an absolute idealist. So it's some notion of absolute idealism. Some idea of the unity of thought and being. Uh, Well, the question is, what's the relationship between absolute idealism and whatever its other is, namely formal or subjective idealism? Kant, formal objective idealist, Hegel, absolute idealist. In the preface to the phenomenology, which, by the way, we will not be reading for another 28 weeks, uh, I, I say the preface to last. Um, I think it's just that incomprehensible until you've read the book. Um, so, there you go. Um, Hegel says in the preface uh, Miller numbers the paragraphs and that's, I'll, I'll use that as a helpful way of doing it paragraph 26 he says one of his typical Hegelian phrases pure self-recognition in absolute other." Pure self recognition, absolute other- otherness. This ether, as such, is the ground and soil of science or knowledge in general. Right? That's the kind of thing that, when I said you know, the surface texture is hard, I meant that. Right? <laughs> to be told that the, the texture, the ground, is 
pure recognition, you know, that doesn't take us very far. Okay, well, here's at least one version of what that sentence means. By pure self-recognition, he means something like pure self-consciousness, so something like the transcendental unity of our perception. And by absolute otherness, he might mean something like what Kant calls things in themselves. So he's saying that the goal and the ether and the ground of his endeavor is to show that the conditions for the possibility of self-consciousness are grounded in the relationship to things in themselves. The very thing that Kant said we could not know. How does he manage that? Okay. That's what I want to talk about for the next hour and a half. This doesn't bore you nothing. In a very simple way, the goal of Hegel is to complete Kant. For Hegel, Kant is a limited or subjective or finite idealist. As I have already suggested, he is going to replace the Kantian notion of the transcendent union of our perception with his notion of spirit, which is already a community with a history. I mean, you know, something very thin with something very fat. Well, the reason for calling Kant a subjective idealist is just the very terms of transcendental idealism, namely, we know appearances only and not things in themselves. Well, let's unpack what that might mean. One way in which Kant spells out the notion that we know appearances only and not things in themselves is by contrasting our conceptual form of understanding that is the idea that our awarenesses of objects are always mediated by categories and concepts that we know con- we know objects because they fall under and are mediated by empirical concepts and certain basic items called categories that notion of awareness is compared to God's awareness, what he calls intellectual intuition. This is Kant. So intellectual intuition is the thought that God doesn't have to wait for something to affect his sensibility and then get a concept and figure out what it is and work it up and think about it. That is, God doesn't have to make judgments. God's act of thought is actually an act of creation. That no sooner does he think something than it exists. That for um, God, and this is the crucial thought, I guess, the deficient, it always, philosophers are always dull people. The crux of God is a modal issue. Right? For God, there are no unrealized possibilities. That is, there's no difference between possibility and actuality, and therefore no difference between possibility and necessity. That modal differentiations are only true of finite intellects. Okay, so Kant says there's a difference between our finite intellect and God's intellectual intuition. That means we have a limited perspective on the world. That we do not have a God's eye point of view. This is all something that everyone knows nowadays from Thomas Nagel, right? We do not have a view from nowhere. We only have a subjective perspective. 
and therefore God or angels, yes, there are angels in Locke's essay, uh, they, they too are able to know, right? I mean, angels can know necessary connections. Right? God and angels can know. Only us finite beings can't know them. God and angels may know differently. Now, therefore, our knowledge is restricted or privative with respect to an infinite standpoint. Hegel's question is simply this. What are the grounds for posing this other standpoint? In posing this other standpoint, it makes a perspective we do not have, the God's eye point of view, constitutive of the meaning of the knowledge that we do have, and hence restricts the being of the world to what merely conforms to our subjective way of looking at it. So, it's as if, the story goes, we are told that our knowledge is limited or finite because we cannot see things, right, the way God could see them. So, compared to God, um, our position is restricted and the question is with what right can we pose this other standpoint as the condition of possibility for the intelligibility and meaning of our standpoint so if our knowing we're not restricted or limited by contrast with intellectual intuition, it would not be finite in the restricted sense. It would be infinite. So there you go. All you have to do is say that there's no allowing talk of stuff you cannot know, and that already begins to make your perspective on the world not finite, but infinite. And this is what's going to motivate, and let's let's admit it, God is all over Hegel, right? God talk is there in abundance. Um... And no one is going to say there's no God talk in Hegel. But the talk of God and religion in the phenomenology is in fact there to discuss this very issue. Namely, the issue of whether we can presume an externality, something that is absolutely unknowable and outside of us, as a condition for the intelligibility of the way in which we do think and know. Right? So, so the move here uh, is very akin to one famously made analytic philosophy by Donald Davidson, right? where he said, you know, people said, oh, our knowledge is only relative to our conceptual scheme. Right? Uh, and then, you know, Davidson wanted to know whether there could be different conceptual schemes. And he made the argument, well, if we could understand one another, then the conceptual scenes couldn't be different. But then if conceptual scenes couldn't be really different, then it made no sense at all to say knowledge is relative to a conceptual scheme, because there's nothing to contrast it with. So the relativity disappears. Now, this is not to say that knowledge isn't conceptual, historical, you know, all of that. It's to say there's no reason to think that any of that 
is a restriction. Right? So this is just taking Kant at his word, right? Kant's great thought, his, his stupendous thought, the Copernican turn, is that the limits of knowledge are its conditions of possibility, and therefore not limits at all. Right? Well, what Hegel wants to do is radicalize that thought so that the thought that they are not limits at all cuts across all the versions of Kantian skepticism. So for Hegel, the problem with traditional metaphysics is not that it attempted to know the infinite. Why bother doing philosophy if you're not going to try to know the infinite? You know? If you're just going to do the finite, take a cooking course. You know, there, are other, there are just more valuable and interesting ways to spend your time You know, if you want to know the finite. But rather, that it had offered a false interpretation of the infinite as something transcending the world of ordinary experience. So, the idea of Hegelian philosophizing is to make everything, and I mean every goddamn thing that everyone ever thought might be transcendent to human experience and show that it is imminent to human experience and gets its role in the role it plays within a part whole logic, right? That it is wholly imminent. So of course there's God. But as we know, and this is what the great chapter of religion, Christianity, God becomes man. Not sort of. That's it. He just becomes man. Then man becomes the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit dies. That's the story. End of story. That's the argument. right? So, now, this move, I think, is definitive of continental philosophy. Continental philosophy is distinguished by the attempt to show that each item that traditional philosophers have thought to be transcendent is really an imminent condition. And the question of continental philosophy, so all of continental philosophy is just doing an Aristotle to Plato, right? That's, that's, I mean, what else is there to do? The Aristotle, Aristotelian eyes, Plato. Bring those universals down to earth, make them do some real work, find them in the world. The question is for philosophy, modern philosophy, the kind of philosophy that Hegel started, is how far can you go without stopping doing philosophy? at all. That is where you lose any possible grip on saying that the world has a structure or an intelligibility or a meaning and you just get reduced what? To kind of positivism and things like that. Right. So philosophy is that ticklish, difficult, almost impossible endeavor of bringing God down to earth without losing that thought that it is God who came to earth and not some you know, wise guy who you met on a bar one night in a place in Brooklyn. Tough night last night. Okay. Um, second move. This will have a break because you need some hair. Let's think of the other ways in which Kant thinks about totality. Because these are all, again, trying to think about it, it's, it's the Kantian thought of totality that, that makes his view of things subjective. And one of the ways in which Kant thinks about totality is the idea of an infinite progress or an infinite regress 
that is never completed. So when he talks about causality, he'll talk about causal conditions. Each condition has another condition that goes back forever. When he talks about his in his moral philosophy, he will talk about the highest good as an object of infinite striving, something, a regulative idea that we seek after in order to realize our virtues so that we may be deserving of what the um, proportion uh, that, that in the highest good, um, happiness will be proportional to virtue. So in both cases, Khan supposes that finitude means no knowledge of totality. That there may be an infinite striving towards the goal, or an infinite thinking that moves back towards the unconditioned, but we never have an image of totality. Well, why? Well, in a way, Kant's thinking here is literal. He thinks if it was a totality, you'd have to be kind of outside it to kind of see it, so that the totality is something you can approach but never get, because, well, if you got there, you would already be outside it. And hence, the thinking would not be finite. Hegel will argue that the notion, this is going to yield his notion of the unhappy consciousness. That consciousness that continually is striving to be at one with something beyond it and never achieves it. He thinks that in order, once you know the limit, you have already crossed the limit. That is, you can't think the idea of limit without already going beyond it. That you can't make sense of the idea of a limit that is, I mean, think about what you used to think about when you used to think about as a kid, where does space end? I don't know, it always ended in a big brick wall, right? (laughs) Well, the brick wall always has, you know, it just never works. You can't think the notion of limit in the way that Kant wants to, right, without being self-defeating. Okay. Let's have a break there, since we're all, I can see, deeply into sweat. Um, let's have a real 15, 20 minute break let the room air out to go outside can everyone just one second I want everyone in the class you're going to get together and form study groups so can everyone in the class raise their hand and take a look around you to who you know and the idea is you know one person they know one person and you'll get groups of four or five, get together during the break, form a group, give me a slip of paper with your names on it. Okay, let's have a break. <laughs> Just to send around and hand out what they hand out. They want to pass on. They want to pass on. And there's more syllabuses up front. Syllabi, syllabub.
group. Good, good. Can you give me uh, your group? In the antinomies, this is better. Uh, in the third antinomy, Kant, which is the antinomy on freedom, con- contrasts the idea of the subject as known versus the subject as free or free and self-determining. And the thought is is that this is the moral agent. This is going to be this is going to be his so-called numinal self. And Kant says we don't know we are free. Rather, we must believe we are free. That it's not an arbitrary belief. It's not like we can decide, you know, to believe or not. We, you know, we are, it's a necessary belief, but nonetheless, it is a belief. It is a form of what he calls practical faith. So, there is a contrast between the empirical self that can be known in just the ordinary ways that people know about one another and know about themselves, and the free and self-determining agent who is unknown, and this is equally the distinction between theoretical and practical reason. Now, Hegel's problem with this is that this subject, the practical subject, subject of agency, subject of morality, is not only unknown, it is equally, in a certain way, given. So it is unknown and unconditioned, which is to say that the very idea of a free or moral agent is equally the idea of a new immediacy. And the idea of immediacy, you might say, is the very thing that Kant should not allow. The whole point of Kantianism was to say nothing is immediate, everything is mediated, and yet he struggles throughout his entire career, the idea of the fact of reason, all these different ideas, to try to understand this practical self. Hegel will avoid this problem in a multiplicity of ways, But the first and most profound way is to say that freedom and self-consciousness come to be. That they are not given, 
that they emerge through practices and through history and that we can know them in all the ways that we can know any historical item. That there's going to be nothing particularly obscure about agency or practical freedom. It is going to be another way in which we know ourselves as historical agents and hence in which we must affirm ourselves as beings of a certain kind. Now, what ties these critiques together of Kant is that he thinks that Kant did not complete his program. And he did not complete his program because in a certain way he remained an epistemologist. What does that mean? Well, epistemology uh, is not just the theory of knowledge, but we'll say epistemology arises at a certain moment as first philosophy. That was what Descartes' revolution was all about. Making epistemology first philosophy. By which I mean the issue became my fundamental relationship to the world is by means of representations. So to be in the world is to have fundamentally veridical representations of it. Which is why, for all the early epistemologists, all the early modern philosophers, skepticism is so scary. Because if you believe that your being in the world is by virtue of representations of the world, and you don't know you can trust those representations, then you don't even have any surety that you are a being in the world, that you are, in a certain sense, worldless. Right? Hence, not only the moment of, of the first meditation, but even more radically that moment where you becomes afraided and he says, I am a monster, I am, must be mad, because he knows that the very idea of letting representations be our way of connecting to the world is a way of somehow disconnecting us from the world. Now, in a certain way, Kant's Copernican turn was supposed to resolve that problem, to be a theory of representation but without the problem of whether or not our representations were veridical because right, the idea of the Copernican turn was I don't have to ask if my representations match the world. The very idea of representations is already the idea of being in the world. That's the Copernican turn. Right? The Copernican turn doesn't ask if my representations match the world. It rather suggests that to have judgmental representations of a certain kind is our way of being in the world. And you'll find the same thought, for example, in John McDowell. That's, that's how I read McDowell. Well, Hegel is going to argue that our mode of being in the world is not fundamentally as knowers, but we might say as agents. Well, getting there, that is, overcoming epistemology, is the work of the opening four chapters of the phenomenology. The first three chapters our repetition of the history of, of epistemology and the transition to chapter 4 in self-consciousness is to show that self-conscious agents are not related to the world as knowers but by means of the strange Hegelian word that will suffer throughout the entire semester by means of recognition. Not knowing but recognizing. 
as if that's going to make anything better. Anyway, but we're in the world as knowers, uh, not as knowers, but as agents, certainly as thought. Well, the turning point, what motors this movement into fundamentally overcoming the theory practical reason distinction and generating a philosophy which truly has a primacy of practical reason, <coughs> next week I'm going to argue that Hegel's ontology is an ethical ontology. That the very structure of his thought is governed by the structures of practical reasoning, not theoretical reasoning. So Hegel's gripe, and I'd say this is another one of his revolutionary moves, called the movement into pragmatism, is that we cannot understand our relation to ourselves and our relation to one another and our relationship to the world if we think of any of those relationships as fundamentally representational. That they're going to have a completely different status. And this is not to deny that we are knowers. It's just that just to take a cheap shot, that knowing is a social practice. That knowing is something that is regulated by collective norms in which we validate certain truths and by means of certain practices and so on and so forth. That is all the thing that you are familiar with from, from uh, post popperian philosophy of science. Right? Kuhn and Lakatos and all that kind of stuff. Well, the turning point that gets us on the way to this for Hegel is in the uh, second edition Transcendental Deduction. And the moment in the Transcendental Deduction where Hegel and indeed even Fichte think that Kant goes beyond himself is going to be in <clears throat> what is usually thought of as the turning point in the deduction, which relates to our knowledge of things in space and time. What Hegel and Fichte want to argue is that everything must be related to us, everything must be related to us as self-conscious beings. If I can use one of Hegel's slogans, everything that is substance must become subject. Which is to say that there's nothing, no substance, no thing, no material, no item, no individual, no thought, no nothing that doesn't get itself related to us as self-conscious agents. So that the absolute, he says, is as much subject as substance. In the transcendental deduction? Well, let's remember how the transcendental deduction works, and this is the moment of great success. The transcendental deduction fundamentally operates by trying to connect two claims. The first says that the I think provides that squares are mean necessary. The necessary conditions for the possibility of experience. Kant's thought here is a rather easy one. It is that 
In order for an object to be known, it must be judged. The only way we can know things is by judging them. And if you're going to judge an object, you must employ certain judgmental forms. That is, judgment as a structure. So we use, say, you know, what? the table is brown. Subject object. With a couple in the middle. Well, if that's the way we judge things, <coughs> and that's the only way we can know them, then that, that structure must itself, so subject predicate form of knowing, must relate itself to the structure of things in the world. Right? Things, substances, with properties, or accidents. So that the structure of the world, Kant argues, must be, as it were, a material mirror image of the forms that we use in our practices of judgment. So if subject is predicate is your syn syntax, then we might say syntax entails semantics, <coughs> or transcendental syntax entails a transcendental semantics. Okay, well that's an easy enough thought, but it's also a subjective thought, because what Kant is saying is we think about the world how? Well, in just the way we think about the world, by using these forms, and therefore we must impose those structures they must accommodate themselves to our ways of thinking. And that's the usual conceptual scheme problem, right? That things must accommodate themselves to the forms or structures of our thought. So the necessary conditions for the possibility of experience, those forms I must use, right, turn out to be these categories. That's the first step. The second step is to argue that the necessary conditions for the possibility of experience are also the necessary conditions for the objects of experience. That is, nothing can appear in space and time that does not conform to our structured ways of knowing. So the thought is here, in the first step, this leaves, let's call it, things temporarily outside our experience. Experience is just what gets shaped by our ways of knowing. In the second step, the argument is that things now must conform to our ways of structuring experience. Well, the thought then is even appearing in space and time is subject to categories where the categories themselves, all this stuff, right, derive from just are the structures of self-consciousness. Well, how on earth does Kant get from one to two? There's got to be a trick. How does he get from the thought that the categories are not just subjective conditions for representability, but further that nothing is given in intuition can fail to conform to those categories? And it is remarkable that in this book, 
of nearly 700 pages, the crux is in a footnote. It's the famous footnote at B160, which I apologize to all the students who did Kant with me last year, since you must be bored of hearing about this footnote. Kant says, space represented as object, as we are required to do in geometry, contains nothing more than the mere form of intuition. It also contains combination of the manifold, given according to the form of sensibility, in an intuitive representation, so that the form of intuition gives only a manifold, the formal intuition gives unity of representation. That must be nearly Greek. The shift is from space as a form of intuition, as a given empty container that is wholly independent of self-consciousness, namely space as it is discussed in the transcendental aesthetic, to space as an actual object of cognitive awareness, but insofar as space is an actual object of cognitive awareness, it is a formal intuition and therefore subject to the category. But that means if space, which is the condition for any object appearing to us, that being space, must conform to the categories, then lo and behold, everything that appears must conform to the categories. Therefore, the necessary conditions for the object of experience are also necessary condition for the possibility of the objects of experience. In short, even the intuited manifold is determined by conceptual conditions. That's the crux of the matter. Everything, even the intuited manifold of space and time, are determined by conceptual conditions. And hence, everything is determined by the spontaneity of the subject, now, Fichte first, this is what his entire Wissenschaft Lehre is about, and I always disallow any together students from reading the Wissenschaft Lehre. It is a swamp. I have lost students in there, they have never come back. <laughs> I spent all summer writing about Fichte, so we may have to come back to this. But anyway, in the Wissenschaft Lehre, exactly what Fichte was trying to do, and certainly what Hegel learned from Fichte, was the recognition that the spontaneity of the subject, subjective agency, our powers, our ways of thinking, mediate anything that might appear to us. Now what this does, if it's right, if this is the right thought, is it makes problematic the distinction which is absolutely structural for Kant between original spontaneity and original passivity. That's the fundamental structure of Kant's system, right? That, that it's structured by to know is to have intuitions that you receive, original passivity, and concepts to which you think. And that intuitions are synthesized by concepts. That presumes 
that there is an unsurpassable passivity and the depth of that passivity is expressed in the idea of space and time as forms of intuition, that is, as abstract containers. If the argument of the transcendental deduction is right, passivity cannot be absolute or unconditioned. Passivity is always (coughs) contextual. And this points to the deep failure in Kant. Kant presupposes the availability of space and time as forms of intuition in order to work from the categories to, say, the schematism to things, right? So he goes from spontaneity, mediated by the imagination, which then allows the categories to get themselves into the world by working up space and time. So what for Hegel Kant's notions of space and time are empty forms. And the form that he thinks is most empty, and therefore the one he's going to struggle with most, is time. We think of events as happening in time, that is, Kant does. Hegel is going to argue that time is not a container. And he is going to replace. Kantian time as a form of intuition with time as a contentful process. Let's give that process a name. History. Let's give history a name. Geist. So, (laughs) what is for Kant, the empty is thing of all time and simply a container in which events occur becomes for Hegel the actual movement of history itself. And this, by the way, is going to be the crux of that chapter of the phenomenology called 26 weeks from now, Absolute Knowing. The chapter on Absolute Knowing is about the relationship between time as container and time as content. So it's a movement from time to temporality, from history to historicity. Well, once Hegel makes that move, that is, once he allows, once you allow the thought that nothing can be given. That nothing is a substance by itself. Even space and time cannot be empty forms that get filled up with content. That everything has to be related to self-conscious agency. Then the entire notion of our inquiry will be an inquiry into Wow, what does Kant say about about self-conscious agency? He says us moderns, as self-conscious agents, are self-determined. So the (coughs) Hegelian notion of the investigation of the conditions under which we inhabit the world 
uh, is equally an inquiry into the conditions in which we determine ourself as agents in the world, or to use Hegel's technical phrase, an inquiry into thoughts, self-determination. So now you're getting that great Hegelian thought that the absolute is self-determining. Well, this sounds offensive. I know, and this course is full of offense. But, but, look, I can see you were pleased with the idea that there was nothing absolutely passive. But if nothing is given, then there is nothing but the self-determinations of thought. This is another way of saying that there is no given. If there's no object that's given, that we're adjusting ourselves to, that we're trying to, as it were, think of us as absolutely outside us, if we're always thinking within the movement of thought, then we're thinking about the self-determinations of thought. So we are thinking that Hegel's philosophy is actually, which is what he says it is, a philosophy of freedom. That the nature of history is the discovery of the nature of the self-determining movement of, of, of reason and therefore a unity of theoretical and practical reason. So what Hegel does by introducing this critique of the given is deny what can be argued to be the ultimate structure of all Platonic thought, and I take Kant to be a standard Platonist, namely the distinction between form and matter. By dropping the form matter distinction, one equally loses a sharp distinction between the transcendental and the empirical, between the a priori and the a posteriori. If there are any a prioris in Hegel, then they will be, all of them, material a priori. Whatever the hell that means. Now, this will... <clears throat> not mean, or at least Hegel does not think it means, that there are not any categorical conditions for knowledge, that there are not any categories. He, act, he did write a whole thing called the logic. Rather, the claim will be that categories are uncovered or generated, they are not absolutely a priori, and that what is uncovered shows how the world must be. Well, how can I put that into a cheap takeaway slogan? Well, Hegel puts it in this cheap takeaway slogan. Paragraph 20, he says, the true is the whole. I mean, that just sounds like a tautology. The true could be the part. So he has to say a little bit more. Here's the more. But the whole is nothing other than the essence, whatever the hell that is, consummating itself through development. So the whole is what becomes. So philosophy is bound up with its becoming, and its becoming is ultimately the discovery of a self-determining movement. 
of the absolute, it must be said, he says, it is essentially result. Now that sentence all by itself should tell you that whatever Hegel thinks the absolute is, you know it ain't the Christian God. Whenever my friend Stephen Holgate said to me, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, Hegel's a real true Christian. I just quote him that sentence. And he flusters and blusters and points to a passage in the logic. And the absolute is a result, an historical result, that only in the end, only, only in the end, is it what it truly is, and that precisely in this consists its nature to be actual subject, spontaneous, becoming of itself. Someone, a philosopher, I can't remember which, said, you know, become what you are. Uh, of course, what else could you become? Something you're not? Now, in all of this, Hegel nowhere denies the premise of transcendental idealism. That is, to be is to be an object for a subject. I've already said, substance must become subject. An object is always constituted by a certain categorial set. I will argue in two weeks' time that this is the premise of the phenomenology. It's not even argued for. Hegel just takes this as a gimme. Of course, what is you know to be is to be conceived. What else could you be? Not conceived? Then you've conceived of it. I mean, you know, he just doesn't see a way around that. What the phenomenology does is examine all of the different concepts of an object that philosophy and culture to now have proposed. That is, the history of philosophy is a series of, we might say, what it is for something to be an object. So the history of philosophy is a series of concepts of objects, which is right, cons- crucial thought. Categories are our concept of an object. So all philosophy <laughs> is a series of concepts of, of an object. And each concept of an object entails thinking about a fundamental way in which we are related to reality. So every philosophy proposes a different concept of an object. Object is form, object is matter, object is life, object is self-consciousness, Object is work, object is freedom. Each of these have their moment in the history of philosophy and the history of culture. What Hegel does is show that each of these are forms of self-relatedness that they are ways in which we mediate our relationships between ourselves and the world. And therefore, puts them in an order, and the order is complicated, the order of the phenomenology, which is both phenomenological and historical, but in in a logical unfolding. Well, how does he manage to do that? There are two simple premises, I think, for his entire project. Premise 
Premise one. There's a difference between modern skepticism and ancient skepticism. Modern skepticism cheats. Why does Hegel say that modern skepticism cheats in comparison to ancient skepticism? What's curious about modern skepticism? Yeah. What's the what's the evidence of that? Yeah, but why is that a, why is that somehow cheap? Descartes, Descartes only gives himself reasons to doubt the external world. He doesn't give himself reasons on the other side. But one thing that was central to ancient philosophy was balanced out on both sides to achieve some kind of equilibrium. So what is it that Descartes doesn't doubt? That Locke doesn't doubt, that Hume doesn't doubt, that Leibniz doesn't doubt. Yeah, their mindedness. They, what sure. they what they're sure about is, of course, I have experience. But what I want to know is, does my experience, you know, represent the world, right? So they keep the mind safe. Ancient skepticism does not keep the mind safe, but exactly as Adam says, seeks reasons to doubt everything. In short, we may say that ancient skepticism keeps, treats nothing as given and takes nothing as immediate. That everything is subject to doubt. Step two. What's another word for doubt? Let's assume that our fundamental way of relating to things is doubting them. It's a good way to start. We're philosophers after all. We all know philosophers are mad. So let's just doubt. What does it mean to doubt? To doubt something is to negate it. To say, shall we say, no. I mean, you know, the reason why, you know, if you want to see how much the French hate, right, ego, right, all you have to do is look at Derrida, you know, trying to be Molly Bloom. Yes, yes, I said yes. And he, he <laughs> I, I love Jacques. He was no Molly Bloom. Uh, um, Paragraph 32 of the preface, and I'm just using little famous little bits from the preface because they're irresistible. Where shall I start reading? But that an accident as such, detached from what circumstances it, what is bound and is actual only in its context with others, should attain an existence of its own and a separate freedom. This is the tremendous power of the negative. It is the energy <coughs> of thought of the pure I. The pure I in its spontaneity is the negation of the world. 
is the saying no to it. Well, maybe there's another word for negation. It will suggest it. Death. Death. If that is what we want to call this non-actuality, is of all things the most dreadful, and to hold fast what is dead requires greatest strength. Lacking strength, beauty hates the understanding for asking of her what it cannot do. But the life of spirit is not the life that shrinks from death and keeps itself untouched by devastation, but rather the life that endures it and maintains itself in it. It wins its truth only when in utter dismemberment it finds itself. I had a drunken night like that. <laughs> um, what moves the entire phenomenology is the force of the negative. And the negative is Hegel's, and this is the crux, his first definition of freedom. The first way in which we are free is our power to say no, to negate. So the power of negation is how we relate to the other. We relate to the other in the first instance by killing it. The simplest way of killing a thing, what's the simplest way of killing a thing? If you're a philosopher, of course. Not if you're a you know, kid guy from the mob. You know. Even simple. Before you can deny it exists, you've already negated it. How? What if? What do you call it false? No. How would you do that? What did Adam do? What did Adam do to get reality going? Naming it. How do you kill something? You give it a name. Because you've taken away its reality. Right? You've interposed something between it and you. Right? So the simplest gesture, the simplest gesture, there's a whole essay, there's a whole story in Hegel on Adam naming and killing and all that. And we'll talk about that later in the semester. But even the simplest act of naming is a form of killing. You replace the actuality of the object with the name of the object. And then you have to work with that actuality, that, that, that name, because that becomes the concept. And therefore your relation. So the, the first thing you do right, in coming to an object is to kill it. Judy Butler says, right, nothing is more terrible for a human being than it comes out of the womb and someone says, it's a girl. She says, that's fate. That's my death. That abjects me. But of course, it's, it's a staunch Yale. She was making that claim in perfect self-consciousness of what she was doing. Now, take those two thoughts. That nothing is going to be safe from doubt, the privileging of ancient over modern skepticism. Second thought, that... The consciousness or the understanding is defined by its negativity, which is another way of saying, by the way, there's no such thing as intellectual intuition. It's the opposite of the idea of the primacy of negation would be a belief that we can immediately intuit something without any mediating gesture. So the claim for the primacy of the negative is simply another way of stating 
the thesis that all thought is mediated, that all relationship to objects are mediated, and now we know what they're mediated by, by death. So this is going to be fun, right? Okay, now those two thoughts together, I want to say, are all you need for transcendental idealism. Because once you have those two thoughts, then you must claim that every relationship to an object is mediated by a concept of an object. That's the Copernican term. Every relationship to an object is mediated by a concept of an object in general. Taking the idea of concept and object in general, Hegel can then, then do what? Let's take a look. Uh, uh, we, as I said, we want to defend idealism. Well, what's the opposite of idealism? Well, realism. What's realism? What is realism? Can you give me a definition of realism that would work in this course? Adam? Come on, you're working on this. I I, I Uh, actually don't know the answer. I I don't have a good answer to that question. That um, that the world um, exists independently of any kind of conceptualization of it that we might have. So there's a sum total of properties in the world that is fixed forever, and we need to go out there and find it out. But our own changes and concepts are getting closer to that world. They in no way constitute it. Okay. And there's just one further thought that, that's necessary for our purposes. It's that something can either match or not match the world and that there are no definitive criteria of that. So that the thought of a realist is if if, if you believe that truth is representation, that is correspondence to reality, then you must equally believe that it could be the case that we have all the possible evidence we could conceivably have that the world is phi and it be the case that the world is not five, right? That evidence and truth is always a gap, right? And of course, the whole idea of the entire tradition was to try to find some way of closing that gap. So in Descartes, it's, you know, God's benevolence, as if God has nothing better to do than to make sure our representations match the world, what a tedious guy he must be. Um, Kant, now you can see, tried to change the story. He said, let's not try to get over our things. Let's say that things must match our categorical representation. Well, that has all the problems that we have discovered. Hegel's strategy is, shall we say, to show the realist is false not directly, but indirectly. Pippin, page 98. This is your one-page handout. That is kind of fifth or sixth sentence down, fifth or sixth sixth line down. That is the only strategy Hegel can use, consistent with his own idealism, will be to undercut the presuppositions involved in standard realist assumptions about being as it is in itself. That is, Hegel will try to undermine and exclude the relevance of such doubts progressively and systematically rather than answer them directly. So he's not going to refute realism. He's going to tease us out of our realist intuitions. He's going to piecemeal by piecemeal 
now it just brings up another kind of thought about what philosophy does. It's a kind of therapy. It's a kind of, of argumentative therapy in which we're shown that, well, what are we shown? Let's see what Pippin says and then we'll unpack it. He will try to show determinately why, given some putative notional determination of objects, notional determination of objects means concept of objects in general. That's what notional determinations of objects is. Some broad categorical account of what objects are. Right? He will say, he will show that doubts about whether objects must or even can be so notionally specified are the relevant determinant doubts. They are only as a consequence of that notion's own incompleteness. That is, the reason you can raise a doubt is because your idea of the conditions for knowledge has further conditions. So that all of philosophy imagines it knows what the conditions for knowledge are, that there be ideas, that there be universals, that I be in relationship, immediate relation to the objects. And it turns out every time anyone specifies conditions for knowledge, what Hegel will show is that there are further conditions for knowledge, and it's those further conditions that are the ground for doubt, right? So that the gr- doubts are perfectly sensibly motivated in that respect, not general. Thus, in this in turn means for Hegel, summarizing everything all at once, I'm glad he admits that's what he's doing, that such an opposition between subject and object is itself a determination of the notion. That is, the very thing that gets the whole problem going, there are subjects and there are objects, is one more categorical determination of concept and object in general. So realism, even as basic presupposition, itself is one more way of setting up the world. And so, uh, so such an incompleteness can itself be made out only on the assumption of a developing notion of objectivity. There is no point Hegel constantly remarks in abstractly asking whether the world really is as we take it to be, whether for all we know this or that bizarre scenario might actually be occurring. Brains in a vat. And grown men, not, not ten blocks from here, should think that this is the most important philosophical problem is bizarre. (laughs) Didn't hear it from me. (laughs) Doubts about the adequacy of our conceptual scheme must have some basis, a concrete radio dabitandi, for them to be serious doubts. And Hegel thinks he can show that the only legitimate basis for such doubts is what he calls spirit experience of itself, an experience itself determined by the developing notion. So what he's going to do is show that all the reasons one would have for doubting, I can get back to where I started the lecture, the infinite, turn out to be part of the process in which we come to understand ourselves as spiritual beings. And once we uh, adequately understand ourselves, those doubts will not be answered, but become irrelevant. Hence, and this is all, by the way, Hegel means by absolute knowing, is that knowing is unconditioned. 
That is to say, there's nothing outside knowing. Things in themselves, God, monads, all those creepy, crawly things that people keep, you know, forms. I remember once having an argument about Hegel with Stanley Rosen. And Rosen, of course, is, you know, was, is a Platonist. And just, don't you get it? You first have to have an intuition of the ideas. And then he did what, you know, you wouldn't think a grown-up would do. He looked up. <laughs> Stanley, there's nothing on the ceiling. There's a goddamn ceiling. You know, there are no ideas. You know. <coughs> so Hegel means by absolute knowing. It was going to mean, I'm going to argue, not that we know everything, that would be an absurd claim, but that knowing itself is not realistically constrained. That there's no exteriority, no things in themselves, no God, no reasons for faith, none of these kind of crummy notions. Okay. In that respect, in that respect, Hegel's philosophy completes Kant. Now, what might be thought to be more puzzling here is why, in order to think that thought, we have to talk about Greek tragedy, Roman law, the absolute state, capital, the French Revolution, Novalis's romantic poetry, get an account of Indian religion and Egyptian religion, not to speak of Judaism and Christianity. Hegel will try to convince you that those two involve fundamental concepts of an object and that they too are part of the mediations of our thought and therefore they too are part of our oh, what's this book about? It's an education. It's a book whose conditions of possibility lie only in its end. Therefore, it is like a novel that is writing out the conditions of how the novel could be begun. So it's a version of Remembrance of Things Past. It's the portrait of Geist as a young <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, uh, I won't um, three quick things um, and I'll stop they are just very quick the ways in which even this deflationary reading of Hegel is different from standard readings of Hegel first of all, the ways I'll repeat I do not believe that the phenomenology has uh, is presuppositionless uh, since everything is mediated so is the phenomenology therefore there is no possible way of philosophy ever beginning uh, that's how the phenomenology begins it begins in the middle I'll have to convince you of that secondly that the fundamental structure of the movement of spirit turns out to be 
a structure of ethical relations so that, let's say, the ontology of spirit is an ethical ontology, and we'll look at the beginnings of that ethical ontology next week. And thirdly, there's often a question whether the phenomenology is a human comedy or a tragedy. It's clearly a narrative, it's a building, it's like a uh, building's roman. I mean, we all know these questions. It makes philosophy into a certain type of narrative. Well, what kind of narrative? Is, is it a comedy or a tragedy? Um, in part, I want to suggest, but only in part, that at least some aspect of a tragic reading of Hegel is appropriate for, at least on the reading I'm going to offer you, part of the, the core of what Hegel thinks absolute knowing involves is the discovery of the disappointment in knowing. That in knowing, maybe in doing philosophy, we do not get all the things we hoped we might get. Philosophy does not tell us who we should sleep with (coughs) or who we should make war with or how we can live a virtuous life philosophy is intrinsically disappointing. And to discover that is also so that what philosophy cannot do and what often has been hoped for from philosophy is that it should offer us a kind of transcendental security that we are, the typical misreading of Hegel, at home in the world. I read Hegel suggesting the very opposite. That nothing, nothing can make us at home in the world. That's what people wanted from philosophy. And that was the mistake that drove philosophy to be forever a series of hyperboles. Rather than as philosophy must be the recovery of the ordinary. Now that would lead me to say, but I won't say it, that Hegel's dialectic is a negative dialectic. But I'll I'll save that thought for another time. But it's not there. So for next time. Um, we are going to read Spirit of Christianity and its Fate. Uh, you should also read the fragment on love and the system fragment. I know you're not going to read all 150 pages. So, since I know that, can I say that at least read the first 75 pages of Spirit of Christianity and its Fate, and especially pages 224 to 238. And next week will be another introduction. So all of these are just ways of trying to find our Hegelian feet to get a little bit spiritual in our life, and then we'll get serious. Okay? Great.